Highwaymen were the robbers of the road, audacious mounted thieves who famously waylaid their victims with the cry stand and deliver. Most people have heard of famous highway robbers such as the infamous Dick Turpin. However, many other highway robbers remain relatively unknown. These little-known highwaymen and women span many time periods and countries. Their lives, while relatively obscure, were often audacious and violent. They could also be comic and even sad. Here are 16 of the strangest, funniest, bloodiest and most tragic tales of lesser-known highway robbers. Number 16. Mary Frith, a.k.a. Mall Cut Purse, who reputedly took up highway robbery in her 50s. Mary Frith or Mall Cut Purse was a thief, crossdresser, and ardent royalist who took to the road in her late 50s to rob, round heads, or rebels, that fomented the civil war against King Charles I. Maul turned to a life of crime in her teens when in 1600 she was indicted for stealing two's 11d. She earned her name cut purse when she moved on to stealing purses from passers-by and was burnt in the hand four times for theft. Later in life, Maul fenced stolen goods and was a madam. Such was Maul's success from crime, she was able to buy an upmarket townhouse and employ three maids, when the English Civil War broke out, legend says Maul took to the road to avenge the wrongs done to Charles I aided by the fact that she already routinely dressed and behaved like a man, drinking, smoking, and fighting. The authorities reputedly arrested her after she robbed the Roundhead General Fairfax of 250 Jacobuses on Hounslow Heath but not before she shot Fairfax in the arm and killed two of his servants' horses. However, Maul escaped the noose by paying a £2,000 bribe and completing a stint in Bedlam, which she left in 1644. Number 15. Captain James Hind, the royalist who robbed Cromwell. Maul Cut Purse was not the only person to take to highway robbery as a way of supporting Charles I. During the 1650s, the antics of Captain James Hind appeared in at least 16 printed pamphlets, as he took to the road, robbing roundheads linked to the death of Charles II. Amongst his victims was Hugh Peters, a Puritan preacher who had advocated Charles's death and even prayed at his execution, and Oliver Cromwell himself. The Lord Protector was on his way to London with a guard of seven men when Hind and his partner Thomas Allen accosted them. The soldiers took Allen during the scuffle, but Hind escaped. Despite having such prominent round heads at his mercy, Hind did not kill any of them. Indeed, the Newgate calendar noted that never was highwayman more careful than Hind to avoid bloodshed. In 1651, he abandoned robbery to join the Royalist Army of King Charles II in Scotland, where he became a captain. However, after Parliament's forces once again defeated the Royalists at Worcester, a friend betrayed Hind. On September 24, 1652, he was hung, then drawn and quartered for treason. Hines stood resolute in the face of his awful death, expressing no remorse and plenty of pleasure for the fact that, for a time at least, he had the round heads at his mercy. Number 14. Swift Nick Nevison, the highwayman who escaped jail by faking the plague. William Swift Nick Nevison earned the name Swift Nick after making a 200-mile dash from Kent to York in record time so he could establish an alibi for a robbery he had committed. In 1661, after robbing a wealthy grazier of a small fortune, he retired from the road and returned to his home in Pomfret, Yorkshire to make up with his father. However, after the old man died and the money ran out, Swiftnick returned to his old ways until he was captured during a robbery in Leicestershire and sentenced to hang. Nevison was kept chained under close guard at Leicester Jail. He suddenly fell ill, and his friends summoned a doctor who diagnosed a pestilential fever. Nevison moved to a private cell and jailers gave him a wide berth, while the doctor was left to nurse him back to health for the gallows. However, Nevison grew worse and died and the jailers were only too happy to let the doctor take the body, which was covered with plague sores. However, not long afterward, Swift Nick was back on the road. Some initially believed him to be a ghost until they realized Swift Nick's illness had been nothing more than a cunning plan to escape. Number 13. Joan Phillips, 
the female half of a 17th century Bonnie and Clyde. Joan Phillips was the daughter of a respectable Northamptonshire farmer, who could have had any man she pleased. However, Joan rejected them all in favor of petty thief Edward Bracey. Bracey had initially been after Joan's dowry and planned to abandon her once he got hold of the cash. However, he soon discovered that Joan was more than his match. The couple robbed Joan's father and made off with the loot for their happily ever after a life of crime. They never married but lived and worked together, robbing on the highway until they brought an inn in Bristol with their ill-gotten gains. After a year, the Bracys were back robbing the highway. In 1685, their luck finally ran out. Joan was captured during the robbery of a stagecoach, and shortly afterward, William died of a pistol shot while resisting arrest. Joan meanwhile was tried at Nottingham and sentenced to hang. Legend says Joan Phillips met her end down Wilford Lane, close to the place she fell. However, it could be this 17th century Bonnie may not have existed at all. For historians can find little evidence of Joan Phillips the highwaywoman and certainly no mention of her hanging down Wolford Lane or anywhere else. Number 12. Jocelyn Harwood. The highwayman who was so wicked, his fellow thieves betrayed him to the law. Jocelyn Harwood nearly lost his life on his very first highway robbery when his victims shot the horse from under him. However, the setback left Harwood undeterred, and for the next few years, he enjoyed an unremarkable highway career. In 1692, when he was just 23, Harwood learned of a Shropshire gentleman, Sir Nehemiah Burroughs, who had a fortune worth of plate in his house. So, with two accomplices, Harwood decided to try his hand at burglary. The gang tied up the servants and Sir Nehemiah and his wife. Then, Harwood made his way to the room of the Burroughs' daughters. As Harwood was tying the young ladies up, one of them was foolish enough to ask Harwood to be gentle. In return, she promised not to identify Harwood if he was arrested. Shall you so? said Harwood, I'll take care then to prevent your doing any mischief. He then proceeded to murder both girls, cut ing, them both in pieces. Then, he returned to the bedroom of Sir Nehemiah and his wife and killed them too. According to the Newgate calendar, Harwood's accomplices were horrified and quickly hatched a plot to expose Harwood to justice. So they overcame Harwood, tied him up and left him with a piece of incriminating evidence. Harwood hung while his accomplices made it to safety with the loot. Number 11. Tom Rowland, the highwayman who committed robbery disguised as a woman. Tom Rowland robbed the roads of England for an impressive 18 years. However, what made his robberies notable was that he carried them out in full female costume even riding side saddle. Indeed, Roland only ever switched to ride astride if he needed to make an unusually swift getaway. Roland was finally caught in 1699 when he was apprehended robbing a person on Hounslow Heath of £1,200 worth of bone lace. The court condemned Roland to death and his execution scheduled for October 24, 1699. Because of his success on the road, Harwood was able to pay for good, private quarters while in prison. On the morning of his execution, the Newgate calendar noted with some disgust that his money even brought him a few hours' entertainment with a prostitute. Some have suggested that Roland only dressed as a woman to hide his identity which could well have worked as it certainly explains his long career. However, the sheer impracticality of female clothing suggests this isn't the whole story. Could it be that Roland dressed as a woman because he enjoyed it? Number 10. John Smith, the unsuccessful highwayman who only lasted one week. 23-year-old wigmaker John Smith had tastes that far outstripped his income. So, on October 29, 1704, Smith and an accomplice decided to earn some extra cash through part-time highway robbery. Firstly, they needed a horse. So they staked out the road close to the Tyburn Gallows while they waited for a likely mount. The location spooked Smith, who suddenly had a premonition that Tyburn was the place he would end his days. However, his companion talked him round and the pair soon successfully acquired a grey mare from a Mr. William Birch. So began a successful week of robberies for Smith. 
Then on November 6, a passing gentleman and his servant interrupted Smith mid-robbery. They drove Smith into the woods and set up the hue and cry. Soon, seven or eight local people had flushed out the beleaguered Smith and captured him at gunpoint. The mob searched Smith and found the stolen goods upon his person. On December 20, 1704, Smith's premonition came true when he hung at Tyburn. However, before his death, he blamed his downfall not on his inexperience but his horse. The mare was a jade, Smith complained, too worn out and broken to be of much use to a would-be highwayman. Number 9. Jack Ovid, the lovelorn highwayman of Nottinghamshire. Cobbler Jack Ovid had aspirations to be a gentleman highwayman, so he gave up shoemaking and took to the road instead. Ovid's career was reasonably successful if unremarkable until the day he robbed the Worcester stagecoach. On board were several young ladies who Ovid robbed with characteristic courtesy. However, one of his victims captivated him and stole his heart. Your charms have softened my temper, and I am no more the man I was. Ovid reputedly told her as he purloined her valuables. However, Ovid vowed that he would pay the lady back if she would give him her address. Remarkably, the lady complied. A week later she received a letter from Ovid, not to return her money but to propose. Though I lately had the cruelty to rob you of twenty guineas, yet you committed a greater robbery at the same time in robbing me of my heart, declared Ovid. He asked his lady love to send him her answer. The lady, however, was not seduced and more than a little annoyed that Ovid had not returned her money. She declined Ovid's proposal and had told him she looked forward to his death on the gallows. The heartbroken highwayman was captured not long afterward, and on May 5, 1708, his lady love got her wish. Number 8. Juraj Janosik, the Slovakian Robin Hood. Late 17th, early 18th century Slovakia was a place of great social instability and injustice. As a result, some people became outlaws from necessity or choice. Juraj Janosik was one of them. The son of peasant farmers, Janosik was serving as a prison guard when, he met the man who changed his life, Thomas Uorchik, the leader of a notorious gang of outlaws. Janosik and Uorchik struck up an unlikely friendship and when they met again several years later, Uorchik having escaped prison and Janosik having resigned from the army, they banded together to undertake their first raid, sealing a cargo of canvas from a wagon. When Uorchik left to marry, Janosik was in sole charge of their gang. He instigated a change in direction, turning the gang's attention from modest carters to robbing wealthy merchants and aristocrats. Janosik also shared his loot with local people who showed their gratitude by hiding the band from the law. However, in 1711, Janosik's career ended abruptly when soldiers captured him during a visit with Uorchik. On March 17, 1713, aged just 25, Juraj Janosik was hung from a hook in the Slovak town of Liptovsky Mikulash. The Slovak people immortalizing him as a national hero because of his generosity and his stand against authority. Number 7. Jack Blewett, the soldier, sailor, and slave who become a highway robber. Jack Blewett never enjoyed much luck. He converted to Catholicism in an attempt to gain promotion in the army of King James II only for the Protestant William of Orange to oust the Catholic king. Next Jack tried his luck at sea. He joined a slaver bound for Nigeria and was sent ashore to trade leftover copper bars with the locals only to be overcome and enslaved himself. Blewett spent the next 14 months passing from master to master until his final owner ransomed him to an English ship. Finally, back in England penniless and without prospects, Blewett decided to turn to highway robbery. Blewett stole a horse only only to realize it was useless to him without pistols, so he took his mount to Smithfield Market, intending to sell it and steal another later. However, the horse's original owner spotted the creature, and before the day was out, Jack Blewett found himself in Newgate Prison. For a time his luck turned, and a sympathetic judge spared him. Once out of prison, Jack took to highway robbery once more. 
However, Jack Bullitt's meager luck finally ran out in 1713 after he killed a farmer's daughter for 14 pounds. Blood splatters on his coat identified Bullitt as the murderer, and he hung in the town of Hereford. Number 6. Philip Twisden, the Bishop Turned Highwayman. Philip Twisden was a member of a respectable Kent dynasty and the Bishop of Raffo in Ireland. In 1752, he died mysteriously after being taken ill on Hounslow Heath. His family gave out the story that Bishop Twisden had died of an inflammation of the bowels. However, a rumor began to spread that the bishop had died of a pistol shot, acquired when he was out robbing passers-by on Hounslow Heath. According to 19th-century English writer and politician, Brantley Berkeley, Bishop Twisden was found suspiciously out at night on Hounslow Heath and was most unquestionably shot through the body, by none other than one of his own brother's dinner guests, returning home. Understandably, the Twisden family wanted to hush up such a shameful death. But why would a bishop be driven to highway robbery in the first place? Money troubles are the explanation given by Ronald and Christopher Hatton. The Twisden family fortunes were already on the wane because of the spendthrift habits of the bishop's grandfather. The bishop's father had attempted to mend the family fortunes. However, it was not enough to help Philip Twisden who, not long before his ignominious death, had been declared bankrupt after spending the family savings in London. Perhaps, like so many others, Bishop Philip Twisden saw highway robbery as a solution to his money troubles. Number 5. Nicolas Jacques Pelletier, the French highwayman who was the first person executed by guillotine. In November 1791, Frenchman Nicolas Jacques Pelletier committed his last crime, a highway robbery in Paris. Pelletier and his gang waylaid a traveler along the Rue Bourbon Villeneuve and robbed and murdered him. The crime was public, and locals quickly raised the hue and cry was quickly raised. Pelletier's accomplices escaped. However, Pelletier was captured, tried and condemned to die, a sentence that was ratified by three separate courts. Pelletier's punishment was due to be carried out on December 31, 1791. However, it was delayed because the newly appointed National Assembly was looking for a quick, clean method of execution applicable to rich and poor alike. So, while Pelletier spent three months anticipating his execution, Surgeon Antoine Louison oversaw the construction of the first guillotine in Strasbourg. The official executioner, Sanson, then tested the machine, using live animals before moving on to human corpses. On March 23, 1792, the National Assembly signed off the guillotine and on April 25, 1792, Pelletier became its first victim. A large crowd had assembled, curious to see what manner of death the ominous contraption set up on the scaffold could inflict. Pelletier was quickly dispatched, immediately rousing several disappointed members of the crowd to call out give me back my wooden gallows. Number 4. George Davenport, the Leicestershire Highwayman Who Cheated the Hangman When frame knitter George Davenport turned to a life of crime, he preferred to remain in his home county of Leicestershire rather than head for the bright lights of London. After cutting his teeth on fraud and deserting from 40 army regiments, Davenport joined the army properly and fought in the American War of Independence. However, once his army career was over, he returned home to Wixton and took to the roads of Leicestershire. Here, Davenport became something of a local hero as he was known to prey only on the wealthy and, like Robin Hood, shared some of his ill-gotten gains with the local poor. No one would betray George Davenport although Davenport himself often courted capture. One evening, he was drinking in an inn when he saw a poster offering a reward for his arrest. I am George Davenport, catch me if you can he announced to the astounded drinkers, hightailing it off the premises before anyone could follow. In August 1797, Davenport was finally captured and sentenced to hang at Red Hill Gallows. However, he had to have the last laugh. Hangman could claim any of the possessions of the executed criminal found outside the shroud. So, to cheat the hangman of his due, Davenport went to his death wearing his shroud over his clothing. Number 3. Robert Snooks, 
the last person in England hanged for highway robbery. By the early 19th century, highway robbery began to die. However, some still tried their luck on the road probably because if caught, offenders were more likely to be transported than hung. The last man executed for highway robbery was James Robber or Robert Snook, who met his end on March 11, 1802, on desolate Boxmoor Common in Hertfordshire. On May 10, 1801, Snook stole six leather bags of letters and bank and promissory notes from the mail coach. Theft of the post was a serious offense because it threatened the commercial interests to the country. So the Postmaster General added a £200 reward to the standard £100 offered by the Parliament for the apprehension of highwaymen. It was a broken saddle girth left behind at the scene of the crime that several people had seen Snook trying to mend earlier that day, that identified Snook as the thief. He was captured during another robbery, and convicted because he used one of the stolen banknotes to purchase some cloth. Snook was sentenced to hang. He met his end bravely. While taking his final drink at a local pub, he joked with spectators hurrying to see him die. It's no good hurrying. They can't start the fun until I get there. Number 2. Michael Martin aka Captain Lightfoot, the last New England highwayman. In 1816, 20-year-old Michael Martin of Conney, County Kilkenny had a chance encounter that changed his life. Martin met a man he thought was an Anglican vicar in a pub. The pair got drunk together and the vicar coaxed Martin's life story from him. The next morning the vicar revealed himself to be none other than John Doherty, a.k.a. Captain Thunderbolt, Ireland's most famous highwayman. Doherty was impressed by Martin's exploits and his apparent resourcefulness and offered to take the young man under his wing. So Martin adopted the name Captain Lightfoot and took to the road with Doherty. However, after three years there was nowhere left to hide. In 1819 the pair separated, and Martin boarded a ship for a new life in America. Martin tried to turn over a new leaf. However, when he found himself in debt, Captain Lightfoot returned to the road. Lightfoot's enjoyed many American adventures, including escaping with his life from 20 Native American braves, after he robbed their chief. He even reset his own dislocated his shoulder in a barn using his cravat and suspender while fleeing a mob after his final robbery in Medway. However, on this occasion, he was caught and in December 1821 became the last man to hang for highway robbery in New England. Number 1. Mad Dan Morgan, the unstable Australian bushranger who held up landlords and helped their employees. Bushrangers were the highway robbers of the Australian outback and Mad Dan Morgan was one of the most notorious. In 1860 Morgan absconding from a ticket of leave after being released early from a 12-year sentence for highway robbery. He headed into the bush and began work as a station hand. However, Morgan just couldn't stick at honest work. In August 1860 he stole a horse from his employers and escaped into western New South Wales where he began his criminal career in earnest, robbing bush stations and coaches. By 1864, Morgan had a £1,000 price on his head for the murders of Henry Bayliss, a police magistrate, police sergeant David Maginiti and overseer John McLean. However, Morgan's victims were usually exploitative landowners, Morgan delighted in forcing them to make amends to their workers. However, he was also erratic and unstable, and just as likely to kill his victims on a whim as he was to toy with them. It was this behavior that earned him the name Mad Dan. Mad Dan's reign of terror ended in 1865 when he was shot from behind while fleeing a botched robbery at the Peachelba station near Wangaratta, Victoria. After his death, ghoulish souvenir hunters harvested his characteristic long black locks and beard.